For the past 25 years, Otis Jean Gibson has been equipping Christians around the world in the vital ministry of pastoral and evangelistic visitation. Fairhaven Ministries is now pleased to present this training as a video course. And now our instructor, Jean Gibson. Let's begin tonight in our second session on the subject of attitudes with two verses from Philippians 2, where Paul writes, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus had this wonderful attitude, didn't he, toward people. Even though they were sinners, they were selfish, they were often ungrateful, and certainly in most cases they were not living for God. But he saw their sad condition, and he saw their afflictions, and he saw that they were lost, and he cared. That was his attitude. He cared enough, busy though he was, probably the busiest man that ever lived on this earth. He went out to seek them. He visited tirelessly village after village, home after home. He was often so tired he could fall asleep, even in a storm-tossed boat. He was so pressed that at times he had no time to eat. Why? Because he had a strong conviction that visiting people where they lived was important. It was essential. He didn't regard it as a burden. And he was not too busy to do it with all the other things that he did. I recognize, and I've felt this way, that sometimes it doesn't seem worthwhile to visit when someone, for example, cancels an appointment at the last minute or comes to the door when you get there and said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that you were coming tonight. Could you come some other night? It seems, of course, quite the opposite when you call in a place where you've never been before and at the conclusion of the evening, they bow the knee to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I never will forget one night on calling on a home on a, two couples that happened to be there together. That's unusual, not related. Never met any of them before. And before I left that evening, all four of them bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. All four of them got baptized. All four of them came to the church. All four are going on for God. One of the men said afterwards, he said, I, hope, I thought that happened every night. I say, well, I wish it did. But it happened that night, and somehow or another, it all seemed worthwhile. I remember well the man who was responsible for the Bible class uh, where I studied, and learned about the gospel and came to know the Lord, not on a personal visitation, but on my own in my own room. But he, he took an interest in me. He spent time on what we call as follow-up. And he took me out on the first home visitation call uh, I ever made. People he had never met before. And before my amazed eyes, after he explained the gospel, he led both of these people to Christ that night. I could hardly believe it. See, the Lord Jesus demonstrated this in John chapter 4. It said he must needs go to Samaria. Now, Samaria was not a place where Jews wanted to go. They didn't even want to put the sole of their foot down on the ground. And the Samaritans well knew, as the woman said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And she wasn't exactly one of the social upper crust either. She was a sinful woman. That was an amazing 
uh, thing that he went there. He had a divine appointment with this one person out of an entire nation and appointed her to the Lord and made her his chief missionary. It said he must needs go to Samaria. And he walked up there probably about 70 miles to meet her. Who else would have thought it worthwhile to cross the Sea of Galilee to see one man who was demon-possessed, whom we now know as Legion? So bad, so violent, they had to bind him with chains, really. One man, demon-possessed man, in a community of Christ rejectors who ultimately ask him to leave. Who would have thought that such a man as this was worthy of a personal visit by the Lord of glory? How often I felt weary when the hour came to visit, and I said to myself, is this call going to be worthwhile tonight? Well, you never know. But one thing I'm certain of, and I want us to think about tonight, is we need to do something about improving our attitude when we go. Because if nothing else, we need to have the attitude that what we're doing in all of this is extremely important. It was important to Christ, and it needs to be seen as important to us and worthy of our time. But our attitude is expressed in many ways. First of all, the attitude is that we are interested, number one, and we show an interest in the other person. How do we do that? Well, one simple thing is that you know your names, their correct names, first and last, including the children, and especially if you pronounce it correctly. That's not easy when a person has five syllables in their last name and it's a foreign name, but it's our obligation to learn how to pronounce it. It's been said the sweetest sound in any language is the sound of your own name being pronounced by someone else correctly. Show them they are worth your time and your effort. Listen well with patience, even though perhaps what they're talking about is not the most interesting subject to you. If you're just there to perform your religious duty, they're going to sense it. But you didn't come because you were interested in them. You were come because you were doing your Christian duty. Secondly, you need to be low pressure. This is important that we do not make the effort to go beyond the work of the Holy Spirit in preparing the person on whom we're calling to open their hearts and minds. We're not there to dominate people, to interrupt people, to insist on getting our point across. When the swine owners of Gergesa asked Jesus to leave, he left. He didn't discuss it any further. He didn't say, well, now I'd like to share with you two or three more verses to make sure you understand. He left. When people don't welcome you, then courteously withdraw. As it says in Proverbs, withdraw your foot from your neighbor's house, lest he weary of thee and hate thee. Eternal results rest with the eternal God. Uh, they don't rest with you and your high-pressure, manipulative tactics. Be tolerant. A tolerant person is not a person who has no convictions, but a tolerant person is one who respects the right of other people to have their viewpoints, even if they're wrong. In fact, it's important to respect the right of other people to be wrong when we stop and consider that God gives them that right even though it may lead to their eternal doom. They have the right to make that decision. You can't correct everyone in the world that's wrong. That's utterly impossible. We say, straighten the world out. You're not capable of doing that if you wanted to. It's amazing. I've often pondered it that even God himself patiently listens to the devil. I don't know why he does that. I wouldn't listen to him, but the devil listens to him, even when he makes accusations against God's people. Be calm, even when others rant and rave and accuse and things like that. I recall a woman who is a believer now in our fellowship and, and happily married, 
And uh, the first time she came to me in counseling, it was the first of a series of counsels. And as she told it later, she said, I really don't know how you put up with me. She said, I used to rant and rave and get angry with you and stomp my feet and everything. And she said, I hated you. And she said, and you were trying to tell me things about the character of God that I didn't believe. He said, she said, but your very patience with me, and I don't know how you did it, was a thing that revealed to me that God could be patient to me and ultimately prove what I didn't otherwise believe, that God loved me in spite of myself. A woman is converted, happily married in this fellowship right now. She'll be glad to tell you that story. Tolerance. Be honest. Uh, it's hard for me with my personality to be other than straightforward with people, but be honest. Because tolerance does not mean you don't have your own convictions. And when it's appropriate in the right way, you need to make clear what God says, not what you believe, but what God says in his word, and then where you stand on these issues. One of the greatest ways to do this is to use questions rather than to preach sermons when you call. This may seem different to you when you call on somebody, and we sometimes do that, and somebody is living in immorality with another person might be hard for you to do that, but the fact that you are tolerant does not mean that you accept their behavior, but you accept their right to make that decision without denouncing them or accusing them. And we've seen many of such people come to Christ, but it took patience and tolerance on our part. I had a man who came to see me just last week, and of course he didn't know that I had a very good idea that he was a practicing homosexual. And he made the statement, you know, he said, I, I like coming to this church, he said, and, and uh, especially the way they treat people. He says, they accept you for what you are, and they don't try to judge you in terms of everything that you do. Of course, I knew what he meant. It doesn't mean that we in this church approved of homosexual conduct. It meant that that didn't prevent us from talking to this person, treating them in a decent way with respect, and try to keep the doors of communication open without denouncing the man. As we call, we need to be courteous. The question might be asked, why be rude? One of the titles for the Lord Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He always was. He was that to sinners, to outcasts, to insulting people like Simon, the Pharisee who had him in his home and didn't even show him the common courtesies. Can you communicate with people without offending them, insulting them, or showing that you yourselves are offended? Can you ask questions without acting like a prosecuting attorney? Can you do that? Can you give a soft answer to turn away people who are angry with you, probably because they're angry with God? Can you be compassionate? This was an outstanding trait of the Lord Jesus. He was touched by their afflictions, their hunger, their sorrows. When he saw the widow of Menin with her only son there in the casket, he was deeply touched by her sorrow. And that was the thing that caused him to raise this boy from the dead. And he didn't always do that in every case. Sometimes the need around you seems so overwhelming. I felt that way when I was in India, India and stood on the streets of Bombay. The very immensity of the crowds was just absolutely overwhelming. Just tens of thousands of people passing you. The sea of humanity. It was really well overwhelming. You sense that in certain situations. How can you, as a Christian, be indifferent to all these needs. Yet, though courteous and compassionate, the Lord Jesus could be confronting, and we must be when we have to. That's not being harsh, but it is being willing to deal with the issues. Having the courage, which is hard for some of us to discuss what needs to be discussed. You know, at times Jesus said to religious leaders of his day, he says, you're hypocrites. 
That's pretty confronting. Peter, the Apostle Peter, said to Ananias and Sapphira, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? If things need to be said, said in the right way in the right time, they need to be said. You don't have the courage to do it. Then we need to correct our attitudes. Ask yourself these questions. They're searching ones. Why do the problems of these people matter to you? Why do you care? Selfishly, you shouldn't. You don't know them. Involving yourself with them will cause you perhaps a loss of time and difficulty, perhaps, and headaches. Why get involved? You have enough problems of your own. Why should you get involved? Well, spiritually, it's because people are important. People are important in the eyes of the Lord, and on that account, people need to be important in our eyes. God made them in his image, every one of them, even though so often the image is marred and defaced and it's hard to recognize. The Lord Jesus thought each of them was worth dying for. That's what he thought. Ultimately, you need to see people through his eyes, through the eyes of Jesus, made in the image of God, worth the death of the Son of God. And you and I need to look at people who are not attractive and who are filled with all of their sins and troubles and to feel that we care about them. Secondly, Although we care, we cannot be in the business of coercion or pressure. Were you guilty of that in this call? You need to ask yourself. Of course, we say, we know the truth. We know what's right. We believe these things. Therefore, we want to pressure. We want to manipulate. We want to insist. But yet, even God does not coerce people. I wonder if it's ever occurred to you that God, being all-powerful, is in an absolute position to coerce and first force any person in the world to do absolutely his will. He can do that. But he doesn't do that. Life and life's decision is up to them. And in a sense, we must leave those to them, even though they make sad, tragic, and damning uh, decisions. We're not in the business of coercing people. Third, we want to be forthright, but never give the impression that we think we're superior. See, that's a thing that offends people, that, that we think we are better than they are. The original expression, holier than thou, occurs in the Old Testament, in which God condemns them for taking the position that they consider themselves holier than other people around them. And in fact, they were all sinners too, in some cases worse, because they had the knowledge of the truth, and yet they were religious hypocrites. We may be holy in Christ, but if we act personally superior, I and mean, we're not going to be effective with people. That's going to come across that we think we're better. In fact, some people say that you think we're better than we are, don't you? I say, no, in my natural condition, I'm not one bit better than you or anyone else in this world. That's good to tell them that we believe that. The Lord Jesus said, I want you to learn of me. This is one of the most challenging verses in the Bible in my own life. He says, I'm meek and lowly. Well, I think of myself, I don't feel that's a description of me, but Jesus said, I want you to learn that from me. I am meek and I'm lowly. Sometime in our great desire, we over-promise. It's one of the great features of contemporary church life, you know, all that Jesus will do for you. It's trying to hold out the promise of every little thing their heart desire, everything they want. They want to make a deal with God and in our zeal, as we call to win them to Christ, we overpromise. 
The truth of the matter is that things may not get better for them when they come to Christ. For a season, they might be worse, might be more difficult, might have some of the difficulties I've not even had before. I need to be honest about that. We cannot offer a solution to every one of human problems. I've had people tell me, if, if you'll just pray to God and he'll heal my wife, I'll turn my life over to God. I want to say, God doesn't make those kind of deals. You know, he's not like some kind of a used car salesman or something like that. He doesn't make that. He doesn't promise you anything except if you come to Christ, the forgiveness of sins and life eternal, and that needs to be enough for you. We can offer strength, we can offer encouragement. The Lord will not guarantee to remove you from all negative circumstances, but he will guarantee he'll be with you in those circumstances to strengthen you as you deal with them. That he will promise you. But he will not change every circumstances to give you the things that you might desire, because the, the typical human desire, of course, is always to have God change our circumstances and then we find out that God really doesn't want to change our circumstances. What he really wants to do is to change us. Ask yourself as you go, were you tactless? You know, many Christians, dear people, are so tactless in representing God. Lord Jesus never was that. He was considered of their feelings. I always think of his great and tender sensitivity in John's Gospel with a woman taken in adultery. He never denounced her, never accused her. Most restrained, unlike the people around her. He was patient with the failing disciples. I would have become so upset with some of those disciples and their unbelief that I would have kicked them off the team, really. Tremendous patience. In fact, one of the things said about him in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, and I visited the ruins of that synagogue, as he said, they all wondered at his gracious words. Did you really, when you called, show that you cared? Ah, that's what they're looking for. Do you care? I've had people say to me, I don't want to be a star in your crown. <laughs> well, I don't blame them. I don't want to be a notch on your gun. Of course not. They really want to know, will you care for me when I don't agree with you? I don't please you? Will you still care for me? I had a man write me a letter to that effect from your home country. He said, you know, he said, you told me one time that you cared for me, no matter what. He said, is that still true? And I wrote him back and I said, that's still true. I said, I never had an idea that I was going to change your mind anyway. I was just patient and listening to you because you wanted me to listen. But I never had the slightest hope of changing your mind about the things about which we differ. But I cared for you then. That's why I listened to you, and I care for you now. That's really what he wanted to hear. But as you leave the call, you ask yourself as you go out the door, did you get to the heart of the matter? I know, you had a lovely visit, and you laughed and smiled, and you had a cup of tea or coffee or something like that, or a cookie, and everything was lovely. But did you get down and, and talk about the issues? How can a good physician help you if he doesn't get to the point and make some kind of a diagnosis and write a prescription? You can have a lovely visit. You can go to the doctor, presumably, for a lovely visit. You went to the doctor to find out what's wrong with you, hopefully, or even if you didn't on a routine check, you believe that he's going to put his finger on it. I remember three years ago, I went to the doctor not thinking anything was wrong. This particular doctor put the finger right on a very serious thing. Uh, it wasn't just a social call. It was putting a finger on something in my physical condition that could have been fatal. 
We want to discuss important issues courteously and thoughtfully, but we want to take seriously things that are serious. We need to remember, too, that people are watching us. They're thinking, and they're asking themselves questions about us. Remember that. You're looking and thinking about them, but they're looking and thinking about you. And one of the things they're wondering and thinking about is what you're thinking about them. <laughs> Such question as he, first, can I respect this person? Well, it depends on whether he respects me. Respect is mutual. I have a different lifestyle. I have different religious ideas and background. You respect me and my right to have those views? Or are you contemptuous in some way? They're looking you over and they're asking that question. Second, would I like this person to be a friend? When you go there, would they say, I would like you to be my friend? One of the greatest titles of Jesus is this. He was a friend of sinners. Isn't that amazing? Holy God, the friend of sinners. He certainly didn't agree with them in the way they lived, but he was their friend. In fact, that, that was an accusation against him. The accusation against Jesus was a part of his glory. This man eateth with sinners, receiveth sinners, and he eateth with them. Think of that. The friend of sinners. Well, if he could be a friend of sinners, why can't I be a friend of sinners? I wanted to ask a very staid student of mine, he happened to be, a, well, a very proper Canadian, for the benefit of those of you here tonight. And as far as I know, he slept in a dark suit like this every night. He was so formal and everything, and I, I knew who he was, and I, I just really wanted to tease him a little bit. And we were talking about the woman taken, uh, that came to kiss the feet of Jesus. I said to him, John, what would you do if an immoral woman came, knelt at your feet, and started kissing your feet? And he just kind of shook all over at the very thought of the thing, and he said, I wouldn't like it. <laughs> I understood that. But Jesus accepted that, but the religious man, the hypocrite that was there, criticized him for it. He said, if this man were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is, and he wouldn't let her touch him. But Jesus let her do it. He was their friend. They're asking in the third place, is this person believable, competent in matters that he's talking about? You always like to feel when we're listening to somebody that they know what they're talking about. You know, that's the biggest thing when, uh, when people are hired to present products in the media, on the television, or anything like that. The number one thing of that person, and they must be believable. And you just look at them, you know, with that expression on their face and just say, this dear man just couldn't possibly lie. This product must be good. Of course, they may be lying anyway, but they're believable. I once had a, a, a national television network pressuring me to appear on a, a network show, one of these uh, news things, because I was involved at one time with an inmate who was uh, fighting a parole action. He was very unpopular in the press every day. Murderer, rapist, all the kind of things that you and I couldn't identify with. And here I was trying to see that he was dealt with in a proper way by the state. And of course, people wanted to talk to me, the press and the television and everything. I didn't have any intention whatever of doing that. And finally, I said to one of them, I said, yeah, I was convinced by the man's attorney. He said, just have lunch with them and listen to them. And so I did. And he, I said to him, why do you want me on? He said, because you're believable, because you're credible. That was what was important to them. I believed in the cause of the man. I was believable. 
in the entire community did not believe in his cause. Fourth instance they're saying, is this person balanced, fair-minded, reasonable? Or is he or she an extremist? You know, people don't like extremists. They may be extremists, but they don't like extremists. I'm just listening today to someone speaking of the, the famous uh, trials and battles that are going on on the pro-life and abortion issue, and a, a woman said very thoughtfully, the very violence of the people who want to resist abortion in an understandable way is hindered by the extremists to do things including murder. And she said, you know, that's hurting our cause. Whenever you come across as an extremist, that does not help your cause because they can't identify with you. You need a good sense of humor. You never want to laugh at other people, but you can always laugh at yourself, really. I don't think you should buy a joke book and carry it around with you. The best humor in the world is situation humor. But the ability in a gentle and gracious way to show a sense of humor certainly is, endears you to people. The kind of person they'd like to know better. Fifth, is this person sincerely interested in me as a person? They're not trying to use me. We all resent the idea that we're being used. That's true in marriage itself, isn't it? We don't like to be used. We don't like to be manipulated, especially to their advantage. I understand that. I don't want them to feel that I'm there as a manipulator and that I'm just trying to use them for some advantage or to enlist them in my cause or to sign them up. Finally, will the person still like and respect me even if I don't agree? I've always been touched by the story of a well-known preacher, uh, English preacher by the narrow name of Harold Sinjin, and he's a very godly man. And he made this statement. He said, you know, for 40 years, he said, I've been going around, and he said, I've been trying to see the face of Christ in the face of others who did not agree with me. I think that's a marvelous challenge. Bear this in mind and ask yourself, as you go out to go out on visitation, and as you present yourself there, in their eyes and in the eyes of God, is your attitude right? May God help you to have the same attitude which was in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.